how to implement results-oriented communications, uh, setting measurable goals, uh, defining a message strategy, and then working with the media. Uh, typically, this is an eight-week course. <laughs> uh, and we actually uh, have written a book called the PR Client Service Manual. And uh, if you're interested, email me at Tom at ablepr.com, and I'll send you a free PDF of this. This is the fourth edition from 10 years ago, and I'm working on the fifth edition. So uh, it's got really good strategic stuff. It's missing some of the newer tactical tools, but uh, it's Tom at ablepr.com, I'll email you a PDF of this. Um, I thought I'd start initially with the crisis communications problem, and uh, you mentioned wildfires, and there's a lot of going on, and typically uh, most organizations, uh, institutions, companies have PR plans and crisis PR plans in place. Uh, how many here have a crisis PR plan in place in their institution? I don't see a lot of hands. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. um, okay, well, we're going to go through a quick, and I'm going to give you a checklist of how to uh, put one of these things together. But this is an example of a crisis PR plan that we did for a uh, geothermal facility over in uh, El Centro. And so they produce electricity for a couple hundred thousand homes. And this goes through action, checklist, priorities, should a disaster happen to this plant, who do they call, the steps to take, etc. cetera. Uh, we even um, conducted a rehearsal after we we did, uh, we did the training, uh, we walked everybody through this, and then we had a rehearsal over there where first responders actually came. We worked with the sheriff, fire, emergency response. They came on site, we had, uh, uh, we hired journalists to come out there and do ambush journalism, ask tough questions like how many people died, how many people are suffering, all this, and so you think you can really, and all these people just performed like that because they were well prepared. So if you're playing for it, think through it, you can really, really do a good job. And so um, I'm going to give you out in a few minutes this so what we call the essential crisis PR checklist. And what happens is you all are, you know, you're people of faith, and one of the things we stress in crisis PR or any communications or any PR is that uh, you, whatever you do needs to be fact-based. It needs to be honest and true. And our clients have mostly worked hard to build their reputations over time. And so if they do anything to detract from that, it's going to damage the reputation and goodwill. I'll talk a bit in a minute about the value of a good reputation. But there are three um, key components, three key principles for every crisis PR program. Uh, number one is be honest and stick to the facts. You do not speculate, hypothecate, or exaggerate. Um, those impacted by the crisis disturb nothing less. So you have to really be able to be honest right up front. Uh, if you don't know the answer, you can say that as well. Anything you do beyond the honesty of facts can damage your reputation and those of your institution. Uh, number two is think strategically for the long term. How do you want to be known one year, two years, three years, or five years from now? So everything that you do is investing in your long-term reputation. Uh, it's really, and during a crisis, um, it's often easy to get reactionary. Somebody, somebody will ask a tough question, and there'll be a gut reaction, but it might not be right. And so the, the best way in something like that is to delay and just kind of pause and say, Okay, I don't have the answers right now, but let me get the facts for you. Uh, and within all this, this long-range thinking is the bigger idea of what you stand for. Uh, and this, this fits into corporate, uh, corporate and institutional reputation. You know, what do you stand for? What are your core values? What are the principles that drive the institution? And those need to be built into all your core messages as well, so that from there, number three, maintain consistent communications um, during the implementation of your crisis PR plan. So you're consistent with your messaging. Uh, you have usually one person that's in charge during a crisis of responding to the media or coordinating things to have other people in the institution respond. 
uh, you cannot have conflicting messages, and typically uh, the first audience to be dealt with internally uh, is your internal audience to make sure everybody has the right messages. Um, the internal messages are key because what happens is if there's a disaster, the media will start calling different people within an organization looking for conflicting information, and then they'll say, well, so-and-so said 18 people died, and another person said nobody died, people were burned, etc. So the, the media are always looking for conflicts and controversy. And so uh, most major organizations create crisis plans in advance of need. We've worked with um, everything from fast food organizations that have suffered uh, E. coli to hazardous waste, nuclear waste, nuclear power, etc. And they have all their plans in place, and some of them have uh, websites uh, that have already been built ready to launch in terms of a crisis. So if there's a, uh, say there's a food warning on an issue, uh, this website pops up and be turned on immediately. It has links to the FDA, it has links to YouTube videos, and it brings the whole story to life on how they really work hard to take good care of their food and their internal values. And the same thing can be done uh, for, for a church is to have your, if you don't have them up there already, is to have things about your core values, what processes and procedures you use to deal with problems, and, uh, and how to go from there. Um, I'm going to, I'll hand this out in a minute, but let me, I'm going to go through the highlights of what the essential uh, crisis PR plan requires. Uh, and the number one thing is research. Uh, you really, really have to be analytical. Uh, it's kind of like uh, crime scene ocean beach. You know? You've got to really get in there and figure out what's going on. What's the source of the crisis alert? What's the urgency of the response, first internally and then externally? Uh, quick read on the extent of the problem. Who or what is impacted? How uh, life-threatening uh, is the deaths, the catastrophe, public safety, are there financial uh, issues? liability lawsuits, internal events, governmental actions, industry disasters, natural disasters, and media hit piece, uh, competitive attack. We worked on a religious, uh, uh, another religious organization that was going to have a uh, very serious media hit piece on uh, some things that were wrong, uh, going wrong, um, and they were prepared to deal with it, but uh, not well enough, and so they were caught by surprise by am ambushed journalists who uh, caught a couple of people, and as a result, there was pretty negative media coverage. So uh, you do your research and you analyze what's going on, and then what do you do in terms of communicating about the crisis? Uh, what are the legal obligations? What are your moral and ethical obligations? Do you need to inform you know, internal audiences, stockholders, shareholders, etc.? How quickly and what tools do you use? I'm talking about, about tools. Uh, what questions need to be answered? Ask yourself the toughest questions that the media or outside the audiences could ask you. Uh, identify the media notification. And then there's a whole process for alerting the team and then going through there. So we uh, pass this out um, so you all can follow me. Some people downloaded it online. They connected the CEO, the plant manager, and other people. They went through what they had to do, assigned parts, and in 30 minutes, they were rocking and rolling. It was really cool. super. So 
you can do this if you have a comprehensive plan in place, if you review it and implement it. And then you go through this process, and if you think about man, it's like managing, you know, when you're going into a building a building, you know, where you've got the foundation, you want to tell the story, and you have the blocks of communication, a different time where the facts lay your foundation, and start adding additional evidence as you roll out. So uh, who's going to do that? You plan your response, and on that page three, Detailed situation analysis of your team uh, does a can candid analysis of what, what all this looks like. Uh, it's working on what data the facts and the data, confirm and reconfirm that the facts are indeed facts, and that there's no speculation. Uh, how do you identify the need to know audiences uh, in, in the case of this, um, this plant and also um, their families were number one? Make sure that the, uh, the families of the employees were made aware of what was going on. Then they went to public authorities, the fire, the police, sheriff, and then on through when the media were further down the list. And it just depends on, in some cases, if you're regulated, which you aren't um, necessarily, they have to go to regulators and public agencies and others. Um, and then there's a level of response required for each with assignments to people to do their follow up according to the plan. And then this number four. Um, implement your communications plan. Uh, do all of you have, you know, within your institutions, uh, are you all the, the spokesman or do you have other people that are the, uh, the key people in the institutions that would be on the camera? So if Channel 10 shows up, who, who would be there? Probably our director. Okay. How about you? Probably the director of the industry. Okay. Anybody else? Another Different. same thing? Yeah. Okay. Have they all been media trained, or are they pretty, pretty cool with the senior warden or, 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 or senior warden used to do PR for a few? Oh, terrific. <coughs> okay, so that person's well skilled in being deaf in the media. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah
companies, organizations, institutions, utilities have a news conference. And part of that is to control the media. Because the media will start calling and it's much easier to deal with a single media event with 20 media people and have phone calls from 20 different media people or 20 different cameras show up on your doorstep. And so a news conference is a good way to uh, manage it if there's something that you have a large number of media that need to know. Um, you also think about you know, where is the stage. Um, you, can, you all watch politicians um, at work. They always try to state something with you know, palm trees in the background and you know, orphan children and American flags or you know, really good visuals. And so think about how you can state this. Um, you would obviously tape it for your own use. You would use at least a follow up on what was said and then um, control access. You wouldn't have to worry about this, but with a plan of the utility to try and control access so that we can just didn't run, run wild is to uh, have people check in and if we're going to be interviewing somebody in your organization or your institution, uh, guide them there, have them have it managed so they don't just kind of randomly go around and find people who do ambush journals. Control access and then a timely dissemination of anything that you do. This includes the websites are really great you know, things for uh, Providing updated information, timely information, and also with a timestamp. So if there's breaking news, like we'll say there's a wildfire and you have to evacuate and different things that are happening, you can update and put the timestamp on it so the media go to your website and they can just track very easily what's going on. You know, first notice, uh, fire trucks arrive, we're doing the EPC, and then the, the time just kind of rolls right along, so it's easy to have an update. And they won't know it, they'll know they aren't working. Other basic things, you know, blogs, RSS feed, YouTube, Flickr, Twitter, all the social media can be incorporated to communicate usually links to your website and your key sources of information. So if you have a, a positive video up there, you can send out a tweet saying, here's the video that has really great background information on what we're doing. Uh, if you need more information on the website, here's a link to our news kit to the backgrounder that you'll find all the details about our organization. If you need the bio of the rector, here's a link to the bio of the rector. So you know whatever you you can use you know, Twitter and Facebook and other things to link to your core pieces of information. And then uh, monitor coverage is your message getting out. Uh, is it being picked up as desired? And this is where you have to get critical if they're not if the media aren't picking up on things as desired. You have to follow up with them in some cases. We'll call the news editors, uh, the assignment editors, the TV stations. Um, we've had them, you know, like misspell names, you know, the person's face yeah. comes up on the camera, mm -hmm. and they get the name and the title screwed up. Pardon the technical term. Um, and so you have to really be aware of that, especially with the broadcast media, because they uh, are often in a hurry and don't necessarily be as diligent as the good print So you have to be really careful. Uh, review your results. Did your messages get through? And can you fine tune and can you send out other information to correct it and it might be wrong? So, constantly ongoing. So, thus far, I have, uh, you know, I've been a talking head here for a while. So, uh, does some of this make sense? Do you have questions so far? Anything I can, you know, provide some ideas on this? This is, uh, again, a quick crisis PR checklist. There is a, a thought process that you could use putting together your own little plan. And the plan doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be like this. It can be, you know, 10 pages or something. So you can do it pretty There's also, uh, you know, other things. Yes, ma'am. So we had um, a situation where <clears throat> a volunteer drove through our wall, and the news media were all on it immediately. And I had sort of a, a question, which was, in that moment, you know, our bishop and people were saying, oh, don't talk to them. Like, we want to block the news media from seeing what's happening. But I thought it was an opportunity to get our name out there and to get our message out there and that we're an open, inclusive church. So I asked the, the, block, the truck that was blocking the thing to move away, and I talked to them, and I just told them what happened. And we did get some good airtime. Yeah. I think one thing that was interesting, though, was you said stick to the facts, you know? And 
so I knew that what happened was the volunteer hit the gas instead of the brake, and I didn't know if it was okay to share that or not. You know? Well, which in that case, uh, you, you are a little bit speculating. So what? Yeah. What you can do is say is, you know, some people think the person may have hit the hit the gas instead of the brake, but they'll have to. The police have to figure that out. But this volunteer has come here for X number of years. Uh, it's one of 83 volunteers that come to our church. We really love our volunteer. You know, some kind of a okay. commercial message. Yeah, positive. Yeah, yeah message. Okay. You, know, you, you, know, you can use those opportunities to provide additional information. Like uh, that's the first time our church has been here since 1912, and that's the first time we've ever had anything like this happen. And we've had thousands of volunteers. So. Should have done that. <laughs> yeah, volunteer drop in. We're 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 inclusive, but we prefer vehicles <laughs> that parked. You can usually they walk in. That's a good one. Uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, you know, I, I was just thinking, uh, our church is a uh, uh, a Red Cross uh, emergency center. Oh, okay. And uh, in the case of wildfires, uh, we're liable to you know, go into that mode. And having a, 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 an alternate home page handy uh, with with uh, pertinent information, that suggestion, I'm going to I'm going to have that in, in reserve. And that'd be cool because you could have facts there that you've done this X number of times in the past. You know, your people are trained. There's all kind of stuff that you do. And, you know, is there um, any particular reason why it should be on that should be information should be on should be on the website versus something on the website that points to a Facebook or a blog or something that's well, you that's, well, that, that's where having links. The point I'm envisioning is having the basic web page with the with the banner, and then that, that takes into a page that has links for information. So that the the red the, the, in other words, I'll send to the ARC. I'm not going to speak for the ARC. I'm, uh, and then if you know fire department, if, if they need to you know find out what the appropriate links are for that. So that if anybody looking for information relative to the disaster, you know, we won't we won't be we'll be sending them the facts rather than. Facts. Yeah, your point on Facebook is really well taken because you can update there with, with photos and, and right. Very that's quickly. so much easier to do with your phone versus an yeah. And that's that's, that's part computer. of it. It's got to be all integrated, you know, consistent right. messages and all of that. But then I wonder. I mean, then it's well, the bonus of it being on a website is that or an alternate website is that then when it's over, you can look back and then, right. as opposed to it exists for it'll exist yeah, forever. Yeah, Facebook's over. Right. And whether or not that's something that you necessarily. That's a decision you have to make. But yeah. If you can have it all packaged as positive things that you're doing to advance the cause, whatever that cause may be, it could be, you know, it could be really positive for the long term. And the additional problem with Facebook, at least that I find, is that not everybody's on it. Right. That's true. So you're limiting your audience. Right. Though, I mean, if you're working if it's an organizational page, and if you, even people who aren't on Facebook can access it. So even if it is a link on your website to Facebook, you don't yeah. have to be a That's Facebook true. member. Yeah, so let me pass out. This is uh, this is another thing. Uh, Ten landmines to negotiate in your next crisis. It assumes that you all will have a next crisis. So. This is uh, Louise. Yeah, thank you. What are some examples that churches may encounter? I mean, I, I imagine the Islamic Center certainly might have a crisis yeah. plan, but. St. Albans out in the middle of El Cajon, the same kind of church. Like, I couldn't imagine. It could be something that's not a natural disaster. I mean, a crisis could be a rector suddenly leaving, or finding out that the treasure is embezzling. I mean, yeah. that could happen to any cycle. Sure, sure. And you want, to have, yeah. you want to have a plan in place so that you know who's in charge of figuring so out what to tell people. You know. Yeah, exactly. Heaven <laughs> forbid. Yeah. Yeah. So. So it would be, you know. Well, nice I guess time. I also sort of to, to the end, like, what's the litmus test? You know, like, <laughs> you know, when are the when are you overreacting by pulling out the binder and getting started versus mm -hmm. letting something 
take a central, you know. Well, you need to do the analysis, yeah. you know, whatever the situation is, do a quick analysis. Mm -hmm. But All you have to have somebody who's in charge of starting that process. Right. So Correct. You have to know what the, who's in Yeah, charge and what the phone tree is. Right. So mm -hmm. Something happens, and so it's a, a janitor or somebody, who does that person call? Right. At 10 in the night or 2 in the morning or whatever. So, and then what's the next stage? Who calls who next? Who, how to pull the team together? And then what are the next steps? And then this 10 landmines to negotiate your next crisis, uh, guilty. Uh, no plan, um, lack of culture and core values. Uh, we work with our clients to really promote the quality of a company's culture and core values. And there, there's a lot of studies out of Harvard and uh, Columbia and all sorts of others that, um, and a reputation institute, and there's one at New York University, that uh, reputations uh, can really uh, improve. The, the higher the quality of the reputation, better the goodwill when there's a crisis. And also, better reputations have been proven to help uh, companies and institutions grow. You know, they can add more members, they can add you know, improved sales, it helps internal morale. Uh, and that's where if you have, you know, solid core values and all of that, and, and I have a piece at the end I'll hand out that speaks more about how do you build in ideas about core values that communicate those um, over time. And then what does a company or organization stand for? And then um, reputation is positive and enduring. And you have to invest in making the communications happen so other people appreciate it. Uh, you can't just you know, build it, it'll come, so to speak. You've got to communicate it. So um, again, in this uh, 10 landmines, the number three, lack of culture, core values. Can't stress enough that uh, it, in, within there, I talk about studies in this book about demonstrating the benefits of the reputation. Uh, big hat, no cattle. That's where people, you know, like uh, the big old Texan, you know, he's got the big hat, but he don't even own any cattle. He's bragging, you know, I'm, I'm a big shot, but he can't back it up with facts. Um, and the sharpest writers, the journals, etc., are always going to check for facts. My number five, CEO ego. No spin. <laughs> yeah, no spin. No spin zone. Uh, CEOs don't like to sometimes, uh, and bishops or whatever, sometimes uh, think that they're fabulous with the media, and so they'll say, you know, I can do this, you know, I don't need to rehearse, I don't need to think through what the questions might be, and so they go out there and they get butchered, so just, you know, one thing that is a, is a word of caution is to, you know, no matter what the position is, you're out, your counsel should be, well, we need to rehearse, and so we're well prepared, just hear some of the questions, well, let's go over them and so be prepared. Uh, I put in attorney-itis because in, in some cases the attorneys will get in there and, and um, they'll turn common, common English and common you know, facts and logic into convoluted things that are pretty bad. Um, torpor at the top, this is just where, where people will make a decision over time. Uh, dueling fiefdoms and corporations will be legal, marketing, HR, different departments will start arguing with one another. Uh, number nine, stuck in jargon or legal land again. Uh, and then the last one, no comment. Um, you could never, um, no comment is not a, not a way to go. Um, the way to answer that is to say, well, I don't have that knowledge right now. I don't have the answer. Let me see if I can find it for you. And then try and ask to find the answer. And if you can't, you say, I, you know, I'm sorry, we just can't find that answer. But if you say no comment, there's Guilt is assumed. Having been a former investigative journalist, um, guilt was assumed if they said no comment. So, and then, so anyway, that's a little bit of light. Now, now we're going to get into the positive stuff. The crisis out of the way. Um, I mentioned, you know, reputation, and there's a whole uh, theory of images of part corporate strategy. And what you do is you uh, think about how do you want to be known one year or two years or three down, years down the road. What are the core values and what do you stand for? And so if you think about what this desired position is and how is this enduring reputation, how do you build it over time, you need to develop the practices where you actually walk the talk. You know, it's not just saying you're a leader. It's 
not just saying, you know, you're the most sensitive and caring organization in the history of the earth, you know. It's thinking about what do you stand for and then can you prove evidence over time based on what you're doing with, with other people, uh, with uh, people within the organization, people outside the organization, and people start developing these practices where they walk the talk over time, again, fact-based, and the result is that if you're investing, in, if you want to be known as, well, a quick example, um, you're working with Pfizer uh, here in La Jolla where they were going to invest billions of dollars in building a research center to specialize in cancer research, and their, their mission was to build the best r and center for cancer among all, all pharmaceutical companies, and so their core values were um, they're going to invest billions of dollars, they're going to hire the best and the brightest, and they were going to have a culture that meant people were working, you know, days on end without sleep to try and find cures for disease, even orphan diseases, where there's a very small population. And so within that, there were, they would be regular evidence. They, they bought a million square feet of space, they put in great equipment, they brought in the United Nations of physicians from Hong Kong, Great Britain, and all over the world to come to San Diego to work on this cancer research. And then they had a culture that uh, actually led to some new cancer uh, compounds being introduced that uh, helped on lung, kidney cancer, and other things. And so they, they said, okay, we're going to be the best, and so we're going to invest to make it happen. So they did walk the talk. And it, over about a three year period of time, they started being recognized. And this also helped their stock value, it helped employee morale, it helped in recruiting. So there were a lot of other values you know, built into that. And so, uh, as we go through this, I'm going to go, I'm going to hand out this uh, last piece here. And this is going to, this is your homework. So you have to go home and read this. And then make notes and come back with your own little action plan, okay? Uh, because you really have to, it, it's an intellectual process, it's not, you know, PR is not just putting out news releases or, you know, putting up, having parties and hot air balloons and stuff. Um, it's really uh, investing, as I mentioned, as images of our corporate strategy. And as you get through, if, you, if you start looking at this, um, I hit some of the highlights. And if you go on to the second page, before we, uh, again, research is a great place to start. Uh, this was written for, you know, for more for, uh, you know, commercial organizations and all of that, but the same value is still true. If you uh, analyze the competition, how do, you, do you want to, how do you want to be known over the next two or three years? What do you stand for? Do you have advantages? Can you totally differentiate yourself? Um, in some cases, we do this competitive matrix stuff for company A, B, C, D, and how are they pitching themselves? You know, what are the key words that they use? Do they claim, you know, that they have a certain qualities of leadership? Uh, are they technically superior? Do they have better people? Do they have cooler facilities? Do they have, a, you know, whatever? And so if you look at how other people are pitching themselves, you kind of get a way of how, how do you stand out from the crowd? You know, what, what kind of values do you have that might be better to talk about? Um, what do you do on a daily basis within the organization? You have some really cool little cultural things to talk about in the way you work with people. You could you could have some things that you, you could have case histories of turning people around, of, of having you know great success stories and case histories. And so that's the next thing is you um, establish your core values and positioning. I mentioned you know Pfizer. What do you want to be? And then what are your kind of like three major pillars? stand for that you can use and this is a good way to organize your thought process too for if you're giving a speech um, if you're going to be talking to you know somebody even a small audience where you want to go in and you don't want to work for you know written anything where you can say okay uh, I'm Pfizer you know um, we invested a billion dollars here are three you know, billion dollars great people great culture on the culture uh, I started working on this compound when I was when my first baby was and it was just approved by the FDA when she entered middle school. So you kind of bring it to life. And so you look for these case histories where you 
you can tell your story that makes a difference. And then if you think about all the different little things that you do, you could, uh, you know, where the, you know, the quality of how you answer the phone, the quality of how you communicate with email, how you respond to people, how fast to respond, um, you know, the quality of caring, what you can do, you do, give back to the community. And that's, uh, think about those core values and how do you communicate that. Um, Number three on the next page is target your audiences. Uh, each audience gets their information in different ways. Uh, you, know, you, you mentioned uh, not everybody's on Facebook, not everybody's on Twitter. Uh, people get information directly in person in meetings, through uh, news media, through online news media, <coughs> media delivered to their home, through TV, radio, etc. So you kind of analyze where your different people get their information. Yeah, the bulletin board, sure. Yeah, whatever you know, whatever works is where do they get their information? So, how do you um, influence that? You know, and so the consistent messages, and so you target the audiences and you create compelling vision and evocative messages. I mentioned, uh, you know, delve into, into the organization to find real stories to bring your, your vision to life, tell stories about culture, um, and in terms of planning. One of the questions Ken asked was, you know, how do you how do you plan? And what uh, what we do, and, and most and a lot of PR firms do, is to try and think about um, developing. It's almost like project management. You know, it's like building a building or uh, you know whatever. Uh, but we, we work. Uh, this is a, a sample spreadsheet of a, a PR program for a company. You know, I, I didn't print it out in color, but the color helps it. But it goes through uh, creative and planning, developing uh, our positioning creative. What do we do for email? What do we do for direct mail? Uh, what's our timing on surveys, promotions, web enhancements, YouTube, uh, Facebook integration, media relations? How do we launch uh, an integrated community program? What's involved in community relations? It's in all the details, and so then also to, with time, you know, you build the machine and you launch it. It's kind of the thought process, and so that's where you can sit down with with an Excel spreadsheet or even you know with a three you know, or eight by eleven pad and just kind of lay out the kind of the timing that you see if you want to roll out a strategic plan. And also within that, um, are there key milestones you're going to face during the year? You know, there's seasonal things. Like Easter, obviously. Uh, do you have camps? Do you have, you know, retreats? Do you have, um, you know, continuing education? What are the other things that you do throughout the year that can be part of this plan or require communications? And then how far in advance do you need to communicate about each, each of these things? So you kind of look at this whole strategic thing within, you know, the bigger picture and how little parts fit together. And it's kind of like, again, how do you build this building? Well, what is it going to look like to do your rendering? What is it going to look like when you do the foundation and you start adding stuff? And then you kind of build it some your time. And then, um, number six on the next page, uh, assemble the tactics and toolkit. This is, you know, news releases, YouTube, Facebook, meetings, you know, whatever you need to do. Uh, metrics, dare to be measured. And, and we're working with uh, one client that wants to increase uh, the percentage of awareness of something that they're doing in the community. So they've done baseline research and they want to go from 46% to over 55 within one year. Uh, there's a couple of other metrics involved. I'm working with another, uh, an online company that wants to go from uh, X thousand numbers of people that like it on Facebook to 50X. So anyway, you know, it depends on what, what you want to measure and that's something that you can determine. You can, you can determine the increased hits to your website, increased calls for more information, increased requests for personal meetings, or you know, whatever. So uh, figure out ways that you can be measured. And then um, eight, conduct ongoing reality checks. You're rolling out your program. Uh, you're doing different things. Is it working? You can tell by how people are reacting to you. It's online surveys. One, uh, one easy way to do this. For, are you all familiar with SurveyMonkey? Very easy to put together really easy surveys. Send out an email and you get a quick read of what people are thinking in a very short amount of time. 
including how you're communicating. We're just doing this for a mortgage company where we have 700 loan officers, and so we're doing a survey to find out what, how do they like to be communicating. So we listed all these different tools and then rank them in one to five. So it's going to come back with a numerical rating of good things and bad things, and the things that the management can use to try to adjust their, uh, their communication plan. So survey monkey can be a really, really easy tool to Image is part of strategy in your homework for a little further reading. Um, that's, yeah, that's kind of the, you know, the short course, as I mentioned, it's normally an eight-week course. Caitlin uh, you know, taught at the State and other things. Um, and that's about it. One of the things on media relations, um, I'm thinking, you know, having been a journalist and all of that, and, and we do a lot of things in media relations on a daily basis almost, is that looking for really good stories to tell about your people and what you're doing as an organization uh, and have good contact and good, good content and good ideas and then gradually start building relationships with media that would cover you. you know, like uh, Louise, you're in Poway, the Poway News Chief can, can cover you. There's up in Encinitas, the patches up there in Carlsbad, and that, that area of the online. Um, there's a lot of, they're looking for content too. The whole coast dispatch newspapers up and down the coast. And so if you think about stories about people and providing photos, somebody that's been successful at a program, somebody that's graduated, uh, it's uh, it's just a matter of finding good contact, providing the facts, and then having a local hook. It can happen. So um, we just did some volunteer work for the Huntington Disease Society. They had a, uh, a shoot for the cure basketball fundraiser. When a winning team was from Carlsbad. And so we gave the photo and the winning story to the Carlsbad paper. And so they ran this big, big spread and they helped drive hits to the website for HDSA. So there was, you know, method of the madness. But think about the media relations and uh, fact filled, good content, and understanding what the media is covering. Um, if you're going, if you're thinking about pitching, you know, the Poway paper or uh, the Coast Dispatch or the Del Mar Times or anybody else, um, take a look at how they're covering local organizations and get a feel for it and then see who's writing the stories. And, and a good little approach is to send a personal email to the writer that's covering something that you may think that they would cover your stuff in the future. Yeah, they're, very, they're very good about giving the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the whoever's byline, they, they usually give the email. And that's that's a, that's a, I think I was thinking of this uh, thing we've got going at St. Tim's right now. Yeah. And uh, thank you. So uh, that's uh, I'll open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, questions. So you're saying to find out who's writing stories that you might like to have written about your organization, and then email them. But what do you say? Well, if you have a story ready to pitch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, have a, do you have uh, some volunteer that does some spectacular work that uh, they've, they've uh, accumulated a thousand hours of volunteering and they've done it in, in Mexico, they've done it in the back country, they've done you know, X, Y, and Z, and something that brings together a little story and the person's uh, this old, they've taken their pet dog with them. You know, find little, you know, personality stories and things that uh, they can bring to life. And, Again, trying to celebrate um, success and achievement, and so you might ask for, you know, within each diocese, um, within each um, parish, find, uh, ask people for little stories that might be of interest. Uh, and I'm sure people will come forward. Uh, Leland Jones got a story in yesterday or today's paper, I guess it was. The uh, UT uh, in, the, in the local section. Uh, regarding the Baldwin Church and, and, the, and the backpacks for, for kids. Oh, nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he also cited several other congregations that were involved in the same uh, effort. So, uh, and uh, I didn't see our church mentioned there, but we were doing a, a, a similar thing. So. Did you have a point first then at UT for North County? Uh, no, but I think I'm going to. <laughs> yes, we have.
have the, actually, um, one of our clergy person cut that out and put it on the table. So I might contact the person who wrote the article. Because we're doing a similar thing. Well, we're doing both things, but we're also doing something called Black Box Desk Ministry, where we're building these black box, um, uh, which is a, a desk that you can put on your lap for children. And that they're building this from, you know, hard cardboard, et cetera. And then the congregation is supplying all the supplies and then giving this out to children, uh, families who are needy and the children need a space and that they can come back once the supplies have need to be replaced, the church will replace them again. So um, that's sort of a ministry. We have about eight or nine gentlemen who are doing this, but to me, Seeing that story raised a you know a light bulb. There Let's go and that, talk that, about this. Yeah, because that that is definitely a uh, follow up. Uh, I'll email you the uh, uh, information. Tom, I had a couple more questions about working with the media. One is, is there anything that you think would shoot ourselves in the foot if we said or did with the media so that makes us like an unworthy source? Say that again. I'm sorry. I don't follow that question. Like, is there anything we should absolutely not do in working with the media? Anything that'll make him be like, oh, I never want to hear from Hannah Wilder again? Well, uh, you don't want to do anything that's, uh, you know, hype or not, not of interest to them. Basically, uh, what happens is the media are getting 100 to 200 emails a day, often from people they've never heard of or never met, pitching stories because the media environment has shrunk considerably. So writers and editors are all under extreme pressure because they're having to do Facebook and Twitter and write stories, et cetera. And so they don't have a lot of time, and so you don't want to waste their time. And so before you send it in to them, make sure it's going to give value to them, not just something that's going to say, oh, who is this person? You know, because some, uh, there's, a, there's a, one, uh, some media set up what they call bozo filters, and in their email, uh, they set up a filter that automatically sends certain people or organizations into the trash, unread, and have bozo filters. So you don't want to be in the bozo filter. So you have to be, you know, provide quality information. I have another question. Thank you. Um, what about, what do you think is the value, or is there value in going to visit people personally and having like a, a printed PR packet do well, do they that? don't have room for storage, mostly. Um, I was at a PR conference uh, recently where an editor of the Wall Street Journal had a table like this and it was stacked with media kits. And uh, he said, you know, this is what we got this week. <laughs> and he goes, and you know what we do with it? And I don't know what. They brought out a dumpster and they just put it all into the dumpster because most of them don't have storage. So they, they get things electronically. So what you can do is if there's something you can hand off, like a photo or just something as a reminder, send things electronically, because what they'll do is they'll take a look at your media kit and throw it away. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and especially the four-color slick stuff. You don't need to do four-color slick things for the media. You can just produce news releases on Word, Word documents. You know, just, and, uh, oh, another key is, uh, how many are familiar with the AP style book? Okay, good thing. The Associated Press style book, the media use it. So you would be, um, you can even subscribe online. The AP style book tells you all about your abbreviation, capitalization, et cetera. And so you got to make sure that uh, whatever you send to the media fits in with AP style. So, so you almost, you almost want to have something ready uh, for them so that there's not they add their style, they add their thing, but that there's a good chunk of the work already done. Correct. Yeah. So that way they move, they're move. they moving forward on it, as opposed to, oh, I have this great idea about puppies. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, great, wonderful, but you know, there, there's you know, more stuff that they can, they can grab onto. Yeah, exactly, and that's why, you know, developing a news release, uh, if you have a good little story to tell about a volunteer or something, Think about writing a story as if you'd like to have it appear in that particular publication. So you write it in a new style, like you want to have it appear in the you New know, York Times, or the former New York Times, any paper, uh, or online. 
tight and bright and full of facts and interesting to other people other than yourself. <laughs> right. So that's, that's pretty much the key. Hannah, yeah. years ago, years ago, although maybe not that many years ago, you um, um, sent out a, um, a template of what you, how you present a, um, a news article. Mm -hmm. Are you still using it? I mean, I use it all the time. Have you yeah. found that effective? I think I might be going into the bozo filter. <laughs> I might be. I send out a lot of price releases that I don't hear back on. So honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Can we email time? Good question here. Hmm? Yes, I was just wondering if you could share a few words on uh, best practices for effective and cohesive messaging. I mean, I know that dovetails into a good bit of the crisis communication, but outside of crisis communication. Yeah, on, on, this gets back to the you know the core values and uh, you know what you stand for in the messaging and and doing the research to see how others are pitching themselves and then doing the research on what's important to an organization and what are its values. Uh, we'll typically come up with talking points or you know like bullet points, like twelve bullet points and key messages to be included in everything that you do. And so um, we're we're doing this with a different companies right now. One um, company that works in um, biotech um, clinical trials, um, analysis, software, etc. So their key messages are, you know, that they've got this certain certain technology that's patented that helps do certain things. Nobody else has it. Uh, they've got 38 PhDs that help develop it. So anyway, they have all these key messages and it gets worked into their news releases. It gets worked into their their letters, it gets worked into their email pitches, it gets worked into new business development. So think about, and also, um, you have to read them aloud. Um, you have to make sure that they don't, they're not you know, jarring late and, you know, and not of interest outside audiences. So it's, uh, that's a tough part. You know, the tough, one of the toughest thing is getting down to small, you know, short, creative messages. Crafting the time. Yeah, exactly right. Crafting the talking points, and so, um, and that also fits in. You think about like a it's like a cocktail party conversation. You know, what are you guys doing? Well, we do A, B, and C. You know, you have got a couple of one-liners you can drop in. Also known as the elevator speech. Right? Correct. Or shorter. <laughs> shorter. So, okay. Last question, and I'm gonna head into the night. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this great presentation and also these great uh, materials. Um, maybe <coughs> my community is a little bit, as a Muslim community, uh, different. Uh, we, did, we did a lot with the media, especially whenever there is something going on in the Middle East or whatever, the crazy Muslim does something crazy, you know, the media is always uh, you know, chasing us and trying to get a combination and all that stuff. But my question is, every time there is something positive, everything, every time we do something good, like an open house, an interfaith gathering at the Islamic Center, and we invite the media, nobody shows up. Uh, it seems that it's, it's uh, something that the media is not interested to cover. But whenever there is something you know, bloody, something you know, controversial, they are very excited to come. And when we talk, I, I talk a lot to the media, and always they copy and paste and cut here, and you know, just to craft it the way they want it. I mean, if there's anything we can do to get out, or how to make the media interested to cover the positive things that we do in the community. One thing uh, for the broadcast media, which is, it sounds like is your biggest issue, would be to provide them with like a B-roll to get some good video, and provide them with the video that they can have backed up, you know, as backup so if the story comes up, they can also pull out your video that has good stuff that you've done. And you know, have a little, you know, like maybe um, you know, different 30 minutes, 30 second snippets of certain things that you've done. Mm -hmm. And have it with audio and without. And so that then they can lift stuff out and, uh, and drop it in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes positive things like that get picked up. We did that with Pfizer and some other things where there was issues about you know animal cruelty in the labs and different things, and so they had B-roll that was provided to the media that showed all these really good practices, and so some of that got lifted out on occasion when they tried to do a balanced piece. So you 
you can also have you uh, have you gone and visited some of the, the media to provide you know educate them a little about what you're doing? We we try to keep a good relationship with them. Okay, you know, and that's good. Good connection. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I would do uh, do people who are in charge of, 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 the, of the newspaper and if there was a particular section, would they welcome our coming to visit them and to talk about what we're doing? I don't have to talk about a specific story, uh, you know, or just to come and make yourself known. You can do that. Yeah, you can. Um, you can go visit the newspaper or you know have coffee with a with a journalist um, and just say you want to provide extra background on what your organization or institution is doing. And then do have something to hand off that you can hand off like a couple of employees or something for background. And then start building a relationship and then later if you have a story to tell, it's not like you're a stranger. And so that's one of the things over time is to you know gradually build relationships if you're gonna be doing this for a while. The editorial uh, content I noticed that um, in the UT has been uh, uh, not the editorial per se, but the, uh, the content and the, the quote departments uh -huh. are quick, uh, quickly disintegrating. Uh, and the local section has everything from the, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, crime to, uh, to the uh, religious, to the, you know, you name it. And it's all, all those stories now are, are uh, the editor is basically. Yeah, well, they've shrunk that because they've, they've cut staff because of the, um, the decline in advertising revenues driven by Craigslist and other free advertising services. And so that shrunk the news whole paper smaller, fewer people required, and so that's one of the reasons these journalists are under the gun, so you have to be, you know, think about, you know, providing good information. So you make key words, I guess, timely words, right in the, the, the front of what you're sending has got to uh, yeah. grab their... So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.